So I'm going to I'm going to let Jonathan give us an overview of his talk a couple weeks ago. And can you can you just give us the current state of things of WebAssembly on embedded devices, please, Jonathan? Yeah. Um, so uh, before <clears throat> I got too far, um, the talk was at the WebAssembly Summit, uh, which was in Mountain View at Google. Uh, it's fully recorded. It was a 30 minute talk. So I'm not going to spend 30 minutes giving you the overview, but uh, let me see if I can at least share the URL somehow. Yeah. Uh, I'm still learning Teams as well. So um, uh, I don't think it likes the security. <laughs> uh, oh, there we go. One moment, please. Uh, oh, no, I can't share um, without restarting. Anyway, uh, I'll provide a link if possible. Um, so I've been involved with WebAssembly for a couple of years now. Uh, I was interested in it specifically for embedded systems. And, and the, the talk goes through sort of the history of WebAssembly and how I got into it broadly, and then actually the state of WebAssembly and embedded systems. Um, but more importantly, that talk was for mostly web developers and people coming it from the perspective of, we have this new capability to write uh, new types of applications with the browser. Um, and I, hopefully, I, I taught them a thing or two about embedded systems along the way. But for those who are brand new to WebAssembly, uh, it was born out of a bunch of really smart comp compiler engineers at, at Google, at Mozilla, at Apple, um, and Microsoft. And effectively, it answered the, fir the first question I tried to answer was, how can we write performant um, actually games in the browser? Because there are certain capabilities that JavaScript as a runtime in the language just prevents us. And there's all this great C++ code uh, for game engines and, and you know, game applications. And there's attempts in the past to take JavaScript to make it work in the browser and make it a little bit more faster and optimize it a little bit uh, through a compiler. Um, but really, this was a, uh, going back to first principles. So uh, you go to the WebAssembly.org website. You see the definition. It's a machine instruction set language that allows you to write you know, basically um, bytecode in a portable way and execute it in the browser. But that's actually not what the specification is. It's a lot more. Um, and in the spec, it talks about this uh, portable language that can be executed in multiple runtime environments, maybe the browser, but also not the browser. And that's what piqued my interest uh, three years ago, because uh, they were talking about use cases that went beyond the browser for WebAssembly. The name kind of um, makes you think it's only for web. Uh, and they talked about VR, they talked about blockchain, and they talked about IoT. Um, and uh, that got me really interested and curious about how they would take this portable runtime and make it work in you know, an 8-bit or 16-bit microcontroller world. Um, and that was three years ago, and really no one was even dabbling in the space. The tools weren't there. The, there was one compiler that worked with you know, the, the four major browsers, and that was the only end-to-end -end experience. Um, <clears throat> but people are doing crazy demos of, you know, uh, you know, Unity engines running the browser and full GUI applications written in C++, you know, in, in a, you know, in a cross browser. Um, it, and that was kind of the savior. The specification got ratified. I believe it's the first technology across the web that was agreed upon by the four major browsers and four major vendors uh, unanimously. Um, so you can run it everywhere. Uh, ML started showing up in the browser. So, um, so, so Dan probably talked more about uh, the, the, like, TensorFlow.js and how some use cases of WebAssembly applying in the browser. Um, but around a year, year and a half ago, people started taking the runtimes for WebAssembly and compiling it for the desktop. Wow. And they started compiling it for the server. And when you're on you know, a, a, like a Xeon processor or a you know, Raspberry Pi, you can take effectively Chrome or, or, or Firefox and take the runtime engine, take code that's written in one language, spit it out, and run it uh, in your server or your browser. And even um, cloud providers started uh, experimenting with a managed hosted version of runtimes taking WebAssembly code compiled and running on the, uh, in the cloud server. So Fastly and, and Cloudflare are the most famous, um, which is, again, mind-blowing that they went from something that was a browser technology to something that actually can run microservices um, at scale. Um, they saw even more novel implementations, like the Wasmer folks at Cyrus, They've taken a runtime. They built a whole new end-to-end -end thing where you have a shell terminal in the browser that's executing arbitrary WebAssembly code. Um, and it's, again, interesting, but it didn't really uh, deliver on anything related to embedded. Um, those Raspberry Pis, depending on, on how you define embedded, 
weren't microcontrollers, they weren't embedded systems uh, in, in sort of the classical sense. Then about uh, middle last year, uh, Intel's research team built a new runtime um, that could uh, take WebAssembly and run it on, uh, on top of Zephyr, um, the RTOS from Intel, uh, yeah. or the Linux Foundation. Um, but they also ported it to different architectures, so um, ARM32, uh, Tensilica for the ESP32. And that was the first beginnings of uh, really WebAssembly and, and um, embedded systems. It's like May of last year. Wow. Uh, so uh, I, uh, I have a few more things and a little to pause and, and take questions too. Um, came out of their research team. So very early uh, uh, prototype, I could make it work, so it was good enough. Um, <laughs> And then uh, late last year, Mozilla with um, Intel, uh, Fastly, um, and I believe Red Hat, another, another founding team formed the Bytecode Alliance. And the Bytecode Alliance is really an, an initiative and an alliance to move WebAssembly in use cases beyond the browser. Um, and you know, Embedded is definitely one. That's where the Intel team and, and what they call the WebAssembly micro runtime or, or, or Whammer uh, is part of, and then other technologies. So, Cloud providers like Fastly who want to run WebAssembly uh, on, on their edge compute um, and, and a few other use cases. Blockchain is also really interesting in this, in this domain. It's not a blockchain conversation. Um, so that was the first runtime that could actually run on, on an embedded system. <clears throat> and then uh, at the end of the last year, uh, right before you know Christmas New Year's, uh, a second runtime was developed um, by the folks uh, at Blink. Uh, uh, Vladimir um, basically wrote a, from the sc from scratch a complete runtime uh, that can work on you know a uh, SAMD twenty one all the way up to uh, you know a, a GCP instance. Um, again, making providing you the ability to take anything that can be compiled into run, um, WebAssembly uh, run on these devices. And so my talk demoed two use cases of both runtimes um, in in, the, in sort of the super demo. Uh, or the, the father of all WebAssembly uh, embedded demos, um, we took the same application written uh, in Rust, assembly script, which is a, a, a JavaScript-like programming language built for WebAssembly, uh, TinyGo, which is a uh, um, optimized implementation of Go that can run on embedded systems, uh, and did I say Rust? Rust. Um, running on ESP32, uh, on top of WASM3, uh, interacting with the full networking stack, Pinging a server and, and responding to a curl request uh, in a in a very in very resource constrained way. Um, so we're kind of at the I would say the, the second inning of WebAssembly on embedded systems, um, and I'm really excited about the, the potential because in, people with embedded backgrounds are now starting to get interested in the space. Like like the folks from Blink, they've been they've been working in IoT for a while. Um, where historically it's been a lot of the web developers just saying. I know compilers, and I know the you know, how to build C plus plus runtimes, and um, it's getting really interesting. I think. Very cool. Thank you for that overview. So I'm coming at this because I, you know, b before working at ARM the last few years, I was at Intel, uh, working on all the inventor platforms, especially the Addison. And at the time, it was a big deal that they had this IoT dev kit, and then there were technologies like uh, Cylon JS and and Johnny Five, which is still existing. And they're excited because they could use JavaScript, Node.js to uh, make this hardware access layer to make it really simple and easy to do uh, actuation of the, and reading of sensors from, from Node.js. And Rust came along, and what Rust does is, you know, it, it puts you kind of in a little bit of a straight jacket to prevent you from making 70% of the memory errors that you might normally make. Uh, but it also comes with overhead of, uh, you know, more intense uh, programmer restrictions. You're getting a lot of errors and things like that when you try and compile. Uh, but you can compile REST to WebAssembly and put that on these microcontrollers. So you're, you're starting to get into this interesting space where um, maybe there's an opportunity to, to come up with, you know, next generation uh, developer experiences that are secure uh, versus, you know, some of the stuff we got away with with the IoT dev kit. Uh, might not have been the most secure uh, code for running on hardware. Whereas if, if you do it from Rust to generate it to, to, to WebAssembly, maybe it could be a little better. Um, so having said that, um, maybe we could have some comment from the Wasmer folks about how they got into this and, and what, what they've been doing and, and their perspective. 
uh, if Cyrus, if you feel comfortable speaking. Yes. So um, I started Wasmer around like one year and a half ago. And the main reason I actually started Wasmer was because I was trying to get um, a framework that I created for using GraphQL. That's kind of like other technology that was embedded kind of like for API communication on the backend. And I was trying to make uh, my framework available in more, more languages, not just Python, but other languages. So I saw WebAssembly as a very good opportunity to actually like have a universal bytecode format that could be executed literally in any programming language and also like other platforms. So that's kind of like why I started like um, looking into WebAssembly. But the more I look into that, the more I realize WebAssembly will become um, universal um, bytecode language or kind of like the lingua franca for software. And then I realized there are like a lot of new waves that are coming. Oh, these waves are like 5G, our edge computing, our serverless, um, our IoT. And all these waves needs like a platform and an ecosystem to actually like be, be um, power. And I realized there was, you uh, know, can you hear me? Hiccup, yeah. I, I got like a hiccup in the internet. Um, so basically like, I, I realized that um, there was a very huge opportunity to create in, like a um, ecosystem that will empower like all these different like use cases. And at this time, uh, basically like Cloudflare just announced it, that like they were like betting on WebAssembly as a way to execute software on, on their cloud. Um, and then I basically like dig more, I'm like, okay, this thing is gonna be a future, especially because like we are gonna have a universal bytecode format that first is very close to native. So we can get like close to native speeds when executing. And at the same time, it's completely like safe and sandbox. So we have started like creating, um, actually I, before starting Wasmer, I started like contributing to other runtimes and none of them I actually like were good enough for how I wanted to have my experience. So um, at that moment, I started like Wasmer based on like a sub project of Mozilla called, called CraneLift that was basically like a compiler from for um, generating machine code based on WebAssembly, kind of. So um, we started like using this uh, project from Mozilla, and over time we realized of the needs of having like more different compilers with um, different um, trade-offs, especially like because it's kind of like when you run Clang and you want to um, to compile from C to uh, to machine code, sometimes you want to run like an optimizer like O2 and say like, oh, this machine code should be like super optimized and therefore like the compiler spends more time compiling it. But the, on the on the other side, the runtime is going to be a little bit faster or sometimes you just care about like compilation speed much more because you're like developing. Um, and in that sense, like you don't optimize as much. So we created different, different compilers uh, approaching that. Um, and basically, like that's how we enter the the server space with uh, WebAssembly. And then from there, basically, we started like adding language integrations, so people can use WebAssembly from other languages. And also, um, we added um, we created like a package manager, so people can start uploading software and reusing this software from from other places. And since then, basically, like what we have seen is um, a lot of companies on the IoT space, we were actually talking with a lot of different companies like Bosch and, 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 and Huawei and a lot of like different different companies. And they were actually very interested on, on the IoT space. But there was one issue. On the IoT space, um, getting a full compiler running is actually super challenging because it, a, a compiler by itself, it takes a lot of memory. <laughs> um, so at that moment, uh, kind of like Intel uh, launched their, um, their uh, runtime, which is basically like an interpreter on top of um, uh, for, for WebAssembly. And then basically after that, uh, Volodymyr, which is the, the guy that created uh, WASM3, um, created a new interpreter that was actually much faster than the Intel, Intel strategy because they do like other kind of optimizations. And right now we are just on the, on the place of uh, trying to understand how people are, are want to use uh, WebAssembly on IoT and how we can empower via software kind of like a lot of new use cases that before were, were impossible. Very cool. Um, Daniel, you've done a lot of work with Pete Warden at Google on how to uh, get a TensorFlow working on microcontrollers and small devices. Do you see any advantages to this approach that might affect the work you've been doing or are doing? Yes, yeah, so I mean, I honestly have fairly limited experience with web assembly. Um, back in the mist of time, I was a, a web engineer and it was like a 
uh, a kind of uh, technology that was coming in the future that I was really excited about. But then I kind of pivoted in my career and went on to other things. And um, so it's really interesting to see that this this thing that was like a far off in the distant future has now become something that's like come around to, to the stuff I'm working on today. Um, but uh, generally, like one of the, the big challenges with um, TinyML and with um, embedded development generally is like, how do you get really good um, platform optimized code that is portable? Um, how, how can we like make it easy for people to train a model um, and have a runtime that, that, that powers that model? Um, that you can then take to any platform or any device and run it and, and make it work. And it's pretty challenging. Um, and uh, there are sort of a, a bunch of initiatives that are trying to make that kind of thing easier. TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers is one of them. The idea that um, Google can work with hardware vendors and, and chip designers to basically make use of the APIs that they provide to do acceleration for machine learning workloads on ML devices and, and they can abstract that away from the user. But um, it's also interesting to think about like how these types of um, platforms can also help with that type of portability problem. And um, where we're using WebAssembly so far in Edge Impulse is basically we had the problem where we want people to be able to build their uh, essentially, Edge Impulse lets you ingest data, train a model, and um, deploy it as a C++ library, and you can use it in embedded projects. But a lot of people also want to use that locally, us included, because we want to make sure that you can um, do stuff like testing the model um, or like running running the model on sample data, for example, um, and see how it performs before actually deploying it down to an embedded device. There's a bunch of reasons why you might want to run this model by itself. And uh, WebAssembly is a really great way to do that. Like if you want to, um, if you can export your model in WebAssembly, you can run it in Node.js or in the browser in addition to these embedded targets, and you can build tooling around that um, that might be helpful in your workflow. So it's already been useful in that sort of like non-embedded portability for us. Um, and so it's going to be really exciting to see how things evolve with um, these uh, RTOS with WebAssembly support and, and see if that makes our lives easier um, in, in enabling people to deploy to lots of different targets. So WebAssembly gives you almost a, a universal target you can you can point at and then that can go to you know interpreters running whatever interpreter is running on a given microcontroller. Uh, and then you, you, that that helps streamline uh, what you're doing in a big way, potentially. Exactly, potentially. And then I'm not not sure about how this part works, but I'm guessing if there are particular um, hardware features that are available at a lower level, um, that we can we can write code that compiles to WebAssembly, and then the WebAssembly interpreter can take care of um, making sure those best possible optimization are used. Um, that would be fantastic. So um, I wanted to share part of the intro to my talk about how I, why I even got excited about this idea, right? Just because it's cool technology uh, is not reason enough. Um, and I think it'll, it'll help some more context. Uh, at the time when I discovered WebAssembly, I was working at a, a company called Particle. They're a full stack IoT platform. And I was responsible for the Im embedded platform. So that's the the hardware, the, the sort of hardware features, but more importantly, the embedded operating system that we ba based off on RTOS and our development tools around it. So developer experience was my main, you know, thing that kept me up at night. Um, and so <clears throat> we had a lot of folks who actually wanted to run Rust and, you know, JavaScript and uh, something else like Erlang. Uh, I'm not quite sure why people want to do all these languages, but it's because they're comfortable in a certain language and they know how to test that language. Um, and so we started doing evaluations uh, on the technology side. Uh, what would it take for us to build a layer on top of our existing APIs, our existing RTOS, to make it easier to program these languages? And it turns out there was a bunch of um, language-specific implementations for the hardware, right? There's, there's JerryScript from the JavaScript Foundation. There's TinyGo, which I mentioned. Rust itself can be compiled down. But architecturally, in, in the way that, you know, typical uh, embedded systems work is it's, it's one giant monolithic binary. And so we'd have to build language-specific implementations to bind to that 
that API and then create a bridge between our low-level APIs like you're talking about, like the, the hardware peripherals all the way to our networking primitives, um, which is possible and you know we could have done. Um, but it also meant that for each language implementation, we might have to have a different uh, abstraction and, and implementation and support those and maintain those over time. So there are multiple JavaScript runtimes, so we'd have to pick which one to use or have multiple. Um, and it meant as a platform to expose multiple language um, you know, programming targets would have been um, onerous for a small startup, especially since we you know, had the C++ API that we had to spend all of our time working on. And so I was looking at it from the perspective of um, developer experience and us as a platform being able to uh, support only one target, which is WebAssembly, and let the Rust community and the JavaScript community and the TinyGo community build against those APIs. So all we had to do is figure out a way to one, run WebAssembly in a performant way, which we're starting to see some of that, which is cool, but also a, a common interface between the, the timers, the, the you know, networking interface, the hardware peripherals once, and then expose an ADI in WebAssembly land to, to actually unlock that. So um, it was really a platform play, um, which got me excited and, and kind of why I got here. It turns out it's still really hard to do. Um, there's features of WebAssembly that they're, they're being developed, um, but uh, like in the, the WASM3 demo we did, uh, it's C++, so you can just expose a very specific API in a one-off way, and we're able to talk to the um, Espresso's IP stack. Um, and I, I think you're going to see people continue to do that uh, in very domain-specific ways, um, which, is, which is super cool. Very nice. So it seems like, oh, go ahead, Andrew. Yeah, quick question. Uh, I mean, one of the problems with lots of technology in this space is actually finding people to do the low level porting, right? They're in very small demand, right? You know, they're in high demand, you know, and there has to be a financial ecosystem for them to do it. And, you know, many companies and many big companies with lots of <laughs> backing has tried to do this and has failed because really the, 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 A, the embedded programmers are too busy solving the problems. They're not actually wanting to do, you know, porting of, an, <laughs> of a, a platform, right? And one of the things, you know, you know, it, you know, if WebAssembly offers a huge amount of software capability, you know, that gives it a value, right? But again, you know, it's, it's getting people to do that work. I, you know, I, I teach embedded and real-time systems at the University of Washington, as well as, as well as working for ARM. And the next generation do not want to be doing that low-level program. You know, they're all Python programmers. I mean, they're just, they just do not want to do the C. They do not want to do assembler. You know, as I said, it's like 1% out of the entire group who want to actually do this. And so, uh, so actually, the embedded industry has actually got a difficulty, I think. There's going, there's going to be a crunch time. And, you know, uh, you know, it's up to the hardware and software people to work out how to solve this. But, you know, I think WebAssembly is one, one solution, which sounds really cool. I really like this idea because, you know, it opens up for the other programmers to do embedded stuff. But, I'm, I, you know, my, my, my big concern really in the embedded field is who's going to do the, the low-level work. And that's, that's becoming increasingly complicated. You know, computer science is fine above the line, but below the line, it's really a nasty world of grungy bit bashing and, uh, and assembly, right? So, um, you know, that, that would be my only comment. You know, I love, I love the idea. So, from that, from, from that work is, is just the business ecosystem to, to get people to do the work underneath. So for all the one, one, one question I have, Andrew, uh, regarding like um, all the quarantine that, uh, that like it needs to be done on the, on the low level side, um, um, do you refer kind of like from actually transforming these WebAssembly files into like low level code so it can be executed? Or like, um, what are you thinking on there? Well, well, there are different memory sizes, there are different peripherals, there are different ways of initializing the, the chips, the, there's, and, that's, and, and all of those, uh, there are multiple ones in different families, so different chips have different ways they do all of this, even in the same company, in, in the same family of chips, right? So, so someone's got to do that work, right? Someone's got to work out the initialization, work out the memory bits, work out, work out how to connect to the basic peripherals and sometimes the peripherals don't work quite as well as they they claim to be right so you've got to do all the software to to to, to get them to appear like they're sort of really working right um, so so the, there's a lot of work there and you know 
uh, you know, that, that the, the, you know, somehow we've got to get that problem solved. And, and that's been going on for since Embedded started in, you know, whatever, 50, 30 years ago or 40 years ago. You know, it's always been a problem uh, to, to, to get people to do this. I, I think that continues to be a problem in the software yes. world, right? Like yes. there are there are browser engineers who are, who are building fantastic you know, magical machines, which are browsers. And there's only four places in the world that people actually do that. Uh, on, on the you know the cloud side and, and you know cloud native infrastructure right there's, there's like this system programmers down here and all the app, application developers um, I you know for you Andrew it just sounds like job security <laughs> <laughs> no but but what I'm saying is if you if you can't work out the business model for those people that, that you know that's the thing if you you know lots of companies have come aground saying you know we build this technology and they will come but there those people are not they, they don't just sit there waiting to 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 support some other platform. You know, they're actually quite a difficult team and group to convince. And, you know, it's that business model part of it, you know, to get them interested. And one of it is that mass of programmers who could be writing applications. You know, that's a super story to sell to those people, right? Um, you know, that that's on its own a, a good selling point, but they, it has to be sold to them. That that's all to to get you all the per, uh, you know all the MCUs supporting this and all this sort of operating systems and all whatever whatever the low level uh, uh, groups are. And that's that's really you know and, and, and you know that's that you know it's a concern of every new technology, right? So, uh, so that that's what I'm pointing. The the one aspect about WebAssembly, one of the aspects of WebAssembly, which I think is interesting, is it it's kind of a free air quotes technology in the sense of it's it's IP free and royalty free. And so anybody who does anything in the space, right? Um, you know, like let's let's say uh, Wasmer builds a, a new um, compiler infrastructure for a particular language. Um, now that is available to someone using it downstream, whether it's a cloud provider or a, you know edge gateway or embedded system. So it's a little bit of a rising tide, but it also means it's not tied to the success the you know the the sink or swim of, of a company or a startup, right? Like, oh, we've read really hard on Rust and you know building Rust embedded systems. And it, it, if we don't convince all the people to write Rust applications, then then we're not going to be successful. Rather, it it can maybe change the model of hey, we actually built this really good developer experience, or we have some you know infrastructure, you know uh, compiler infrastructure, and oh, you like Rust, so you you use our technology. So it sort of inverts the pulling people to to use a the technology they want to. I know that I'm not selling it super hard, but it's as opposed to um, I'm a startup and I'm building a Python based embedded programming language and you have to, if you don't like Python, well, you should like Python. It, it, it allows for more flexibility in terms of what you can offer, I, I hope. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there's an interesting additional angle on the IoT side. We've been talking about uh, the microcontrollers and so on, but there's the 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 guy that created Docker, one of the co-creators of Docker, when he saw uh, WebAssembly technology uh, reaching outside of the browser and and doing and communicating with the, the operating system, he said, uh, "If Web if this technology had existed, I wouldn't have needed to create Docker." So that leads me down the road of you know one of the developments in the IoT ecosystem is companies like Balina. Uh, they're deploying Docker containers to Raspberry Pi devices at the edge. And those devices might be controlling some microcontroller-based thing. Then you've got NXP that are doing the IMX8 that's got A-class cores nested with M-class cores. So with WebAssembly, maybe you end up with a new workflow where you're deploying the WebAssembly thing, and then you're able to control both the A-class core uh, and the microcontroller from the same code base. And this is where I'm just begin making things up. But so what about that? What about those those A class core use cases and and how do you how do you manage to deploy fleets that actuate things? Um. So I, I actually um, I met someone from from Zen uh, and he, he described it as oh, maybe maybe we're reimagining the hypervisor uh, with something like WebAssembly. So if you look at the architecture from the cloud providers who are, are investing in WebAssembly as a container technology, basically like Docker is today to normal um, container-based cloud, um, it provides you a sandbox. It has security primitives built in. It allows you to, it has a binary format, um, so you can distribute it over the wire. 
Um, but it also has a packaging format, which is the other side of the uh, of you know distributing. Um, so it allows, for example, Cloudflare. They use um, they use V8, which is the engine behind Chrome, to run all your WebAssembly applications. And they can fit way more WebAssembly uh, binaries in the in the same you know data center than they could if it was on, using Kubernetes and Docker. And they they tried it. Um, so I, I think as you shrink that down, it's it's actually kind of the same model, right? Because they're running Zen on edge gateways and automotive applications where you have your media center and maybe you have your, uh, your telecommunication for the end user, um, but you can do it smaller. Um, so less resources, cheaper hardware. Um, you get security guarantees that you know, maybe you don't have with something like a hypervisor or at the very least like a Linux runtime. Um, and it also gives flexibility for application developers. They can, you know, the... The mapping software can be written in Kotlin, and the phone application can be written in C++, and they can maybe share securely data between each other if they choose to do so. Um, but I think this sort of like hypervisor analogy starts to become interesting in, in the edge world uh, with a significant um, savings of uh, resources and, and, and potentially increase in security. So here's the interesting thing about hypervisors. Like, uh, my understanding is that um, the, when they when they go to add instructions to the ISA uh, hypervisor, this is where I'm beginning to get outside of my depth. But you know, RISC five, for example, they're looking at uh, adding special instructions to enable hypervisor support. So my question overall is, will there be room if WebAssembly becomes highly pervasive? Uh, will there need to be special instructions for WebAssembly workloads? Uh, open question, and I, I don't know the answer. And, and I might I might ask Cyrus to jump in too here, but that's where the WASI extensions to WebAssembly uh, come into play. So um, WebAssembly is effectively the instruction set and allows you to compile to different targets and run it everywhere. The the WASI, the system interface, um, is talking about actually interfacing with a host environment. Because in the web, we take for granted that it's a browser and we have a little sandbox. Um, and there's some APIs to like access files and microphones, like probably some of us are using now. WASI is, is, a, is supposed to be a suite of specifications that allow it, for example, limited but secure file access or network access. Um, and that's probably where the things that are missing or needed for a hypervisor-like environment um, would live. So uh, there is no concept of a network driver or a network interface or even the network packet in WebAssembly, but there's a networking specification that's being developed for WASIs for environments that want to expose in that way can. Um, Anyway, Cyrus, anything to add? Yes. So um, I think like there are there are a few things that we uh, talk about. One is kind of like um, kind of like how a uh, similar strategy uh, kind of like to Docker we can apply to like WebAssembly and how this kind of like can empower new use cases on IoT. And I, I think on that space, like what we are seeing is there are a lot of needs to actually like have like something that is much more lightweight. Than, than Docker that allows to actually like have the same way of running software, assuring that this, your software will run exactly the same way in either a IoT device that is like low end or a IoT device that is super powerful or even a desktop computer. So one of the cool things about that is also like you have the reproducibility on the software, which is like one thing that Docker brought on, on the cloud environment. Once you have like the same reproducibility of software on IoT, you can open a lot of like new use cases that before were impossible. So what that means is you can allow actually to people for creating software on your main browser, test it there. And if it works on your browser, it will actually work on your IoT device. And the same for testing like software I, I don't know, like locally in your in your local development server in I don't know your laptop, and basically like if things work on your laptop, then like you can assure like a super thin runtime that like comply with the WebAssembly specification will actually work properly on your IoT device. So I think that's kind of like super super compelling. On the on the other side, this side is more about like um, how we can how WebAssembly can become like this key technology that actually like will empower a lot of like new use cases on the IoT world. Then the second part that we were um, talking about is more kind of like about like a unified API for dealing with um, with a lot of uh, common IoT use cases. Um, so on that front, like there has been already like a lot of effort on on some side of the WebAssembly world just now like to bring some kind of operating system calls as uh, Jonathan commented, like WASI and so on, to basically like be able 
I don't know, read a file and, and get some co its contents or read the, the files in that directory. So kind of like low level operating system interface. Um, on the IoT world, I think we still need uh, to unify or to do effort there to unifying APIs in a way that actually like a software can run exactly the same way just because they target the same API. They can work the same way on a Cortex chipset than in a low end our ARM device. And the only thing that like it's needed there is just to have like a unifying API. So like basically like when you compile to this, this low level uh, WebAssembly bytecode, um, this WebAssembly bytecode is not dependent on a specific chipset, but is dependent more into a uh, capability. Kind of like, oh, does my chip uh, or does my platform IoT device support, I don't know, like this uh, opening and, 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 and closing like um, something with electricity. Um, so I think on that, on that sense, once, uh, the only thing left there is mainly like unifying. But once we do, we are going to see a lot of new use cases. And it is, I think they are going to go, apart of safety, which I think is a nice side effect, um, I think apart from that, like what we are going to see is reproducibility of software. Uh, so that means like people can just create like programs, I don't know, in your browser, can create programs on, on, on their laptop. They will have their WebAssembly binary for that program and they will just ship it somewhere and they forget. Basically, like, if it works locally, it will work somewhere else. So it's pretty interesting. Um, one of the kind of unexpected use cases that we saw for TensorFlow Lite um, is, is the use of it as this kind of uh, package for software. Essentially, a TensorFlow model is an execution graph. Um, it tells the interpreter which operations to run and in what order and on what data. Um, it's, it's just a way of describing a, a program. It's very domain specific to deep learning, but it's a way of describing uh, an arbitrary program that an interpreter can run. And because of that, um, a TensorFlow Lite model is really portable. So you can train the same model and have it run on a server. You can have it run on a mobile phone. You have it run on an embedded device. Um, and the, the thing that is, Important is that you have an interpreter written for each of those platforms that knows how to do the low level stuff, the stuff that involves the operating system or the, the, the bare metal um, to implement those ops. That's the hard part. And that's the part where you have to get the help of the people who are designing and building the hardware or the operating system that you're running on. Um, but if you can solve that problem as an organization, which is what Google's strategy is, um, then you enable for developers the ability to just write a program once, compile it into this TensorFlow Lite model, and then bring it anywhere, and it will just work. Um, and uh, so I think that's that's huge. There's been a bunch of, of applications I've seen where it's it's been like we, we never would have thought that people would have used TensorFlow for this type of use case, but they've used it to bring a model to some kind of obscure operating system that like no one else uses, but because of that specific industry, you're forced to use it um, for some types of application. Um, so it's it's been an extremely powerful thing. And I think any technology that like um, also brings those types of benefits is gonna be very successful as long as there is that support in terms of building those underlying implementations. And that's the really difficult part. Um, and the thing that makes that easier is having things like a good test suite that allows you as a, an integrator to figure out whether you've actually implemented all of the, the necessary um, low-level APIs. <clears throat> I've been looking at these guys, Ant Micro, they have this thing called Renode, and it's a virtual SOC, I mean, it's got several layers, but the, the main one is like a board simulator, and it lets you uh, simulate, uh, do, do board simulation. So I wonder if people think that that trend should, is a good one, and if if this simulation of all these systems might help uh, uh, troubleshoot some of these problems in the future. Yeah, I I, it's a, I think simulation is, is desperately needed in a way that's scalable and useful for hardware and firmware teams. Um, I kind of coming from that history of trying to build developer experience as a particle, uh, we, we certainly want to enable our end customers to have that. And at the time, you know, Reno, Reno was super young. There's also a startup called Jumper, was doing um, network simulation for, for devices. Um, but what's really interesting is 
when you take any of the software and the software tooling from the embedded world and show it to a web developer or a mobile developer, they step back like, are you are you living in the in the the early like early nineties, late eighties in terms of experience? Like the things you can do in those software environments, you know, simulation at scale, um, inner inner system communications testing, uh, you know, testing, you know, load testing, um, auto completion, uh, and, and code suggestions. All these things are barely making it to embedded systems where you can simulate your entire app with fake users uh, on mobile. It was, you know, at scale on, on Google servers, right? Yeah. Um, and I, I definitely think that that there there is an opportunity there. Um, I think there's a need there. When you start getting to IoT in particular, it's extremely hard to isolate the embedded system from the the network itself, um, or for the network technology. And the more you can, you know, lean on software simulations, the better. Um, I, I used to work at, at Nest, and they had full software simulation of all their uh, of all their products because they built a POSIX environment that that effectively simulated the firmware um, and with every iteration we tested it on you know 60 smoke detectors and you know a dozen thermostats um, before we even got it onto a piece of hardware and that was super hard to implement and very specific to nest um, and it should be generalizable i think i think it should be generalizable from platform providers from from chipset vendors, um, from ecosystems like TinyML and and you know Artosses and things like that, and I I look forward to the day where that becomes accessible, like it is for mobile and and, and web developers. Um, sorry, so so off soapbox. I'm off my soapbox now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, any other observations, uh, Andrew? You have so many. Uh, yeah, I have a I have a whole list of questions, so I'm not going to go through the questions. Um, um, an observation. Uh, you can ask the question. That's fine. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I, you know, there's, there's, you know, you know, there's a very famous line in computer science which every problem can be solved by another level of abstraction, but that again produces another problem, right? So, 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 what are the problems that you know WebAssembly solves, and what are the problems that it introduces, right? That's something you need to think about, right? Because the, an abstraction layer is never a utopian. You know, it's never a utopian. It's a, you know, um, you know, uh, especially the companies that produce so many abstract layers. There, you know, someone at the top goes, but I want this extra feature, and then you realize that someone has to change every abstraction layer right down the system to actually add it into the hardware and and get that process right. So, so, so those are the things I I, I would think about is you know where 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 your strengths are and where 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 their weaknesses and the weaknesses you then have to fortify um you know the the pieces and and i said you know finding people to do the porting work is probably one of them but you know um uh, that would be the question the sort of general question of the technology uh, you know the getting all the software is great you know and and i love that side the only so so one of the scenarios i would think of is you know you have a an embedded device it's got an odd memory map because they're not normally pure. They're not. They're not got this pure. You know, they've got. There's no MMU in the way. The. You know, they've got this odd setup, and that's that's one scenario which is difficult. And then say they have a sensor which is quite unique. So the whole point of embedded is uniqueness. It's not about building standards. You know, it's a, that's why it drives people crazy because they go, if only we could standardize everything. Well, the whole point of embedded is the problem's unusual. You know, this is a it's a device stuck somewhere unusually to do something odd, right? And that is the and how well WebAssembly fits into the the oddities of the system. You know, uh, uh, and that's that's really uh, you know uh, an odd sensor that has an odd interface. That how do you get that uh, available in a standard way uh, up to the WebAssembly world where somebody could write an application to take advantage of it? You know, and that, and how many, how many steps of changes are needed to do that? If there's a huge step, number of steps of changes, then then it's problematic. If there's very short uh, set of changes and easy to ex expand a concept, then and you have a general set of APIs that allows you to expand and and you know have a sort of device driver like structure at the web assembly level, then great, that's fantastic, right? So 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 those are the sort of questions I would have. So, oh, sorry, uh, James, go ahead. 
Um, yeah, I was actually going to add on to Andrew's thing of uh, in, in listening to all this and thinking about the world I live in. Um, really, one of the issues that I see is really at the interpreter level, the folks that write this, <clears throat> it would be great to have one to run in our systems, but I would still need an escape hatch of some way to tie in underneath the hood into the interpreter of, you know, I need to get down to C because I've got a temperature sensor and it implemented I squared C wrong, and I've got to rewrite the driver for that. And so having that level of, yeah, I can plug that in and here's the API. I think this is kind of where Andrew was going of, okay, here's the predefined API. If you write to this thing, um, that gives you, now you can plug into the interpreter and it just shows up like any other I squared C device or any other thing on your system. So I guess that's not a really a question, more of an observation. No, it, the, the thing I was going to bring up around strengths and weaknesses, um, well, you know, it's pretty early, right? The, I, we, we discussed briefly about the WASM system interface, um, and there is no concept of even a, you know, a port or a peripheral or a register, right? It, it is, is really, truly, it, we're still at the language level. And the WASI, the folks working on WASI are trying to define things like timers and crypto and, you know, network interfaces. Um, so those, are, those abstractions at the lower levels of the system are still not even being defined yet. And I, I'm not sure they're going to have one true solution that works for both, you know, typical operating system hosts, like on a server with Linux and, and file system based access to everything, to an embedded system where it's, you know, you're, you're doing DMA and, and talking directly to registers. Um, but you, like, from my perspective, you can squint and say, well, we could probably define things that work in both environments and have the embedded thing and, you know, make it work such that it knows that it's an embedded environment. And the abstractions that exist, that that need to exist are not even thought of yet because we don't have those low-level primitives to say, mm -hmm. is this a you know Python API that's talking to web assembly talking to you know I, I squared C uh, how or is it uh, a way to talk directly to memory that then gets built on top of a standardized mm -hmm. interface which then language maintainer. So I think we haven't we haven't got to that point yet to, right. to make the mistakes. <laughs> so it's early. Yeah, I mean I mean yes. these are sort of the uh, I will. That, um... Uh, embedded, you know, they they cause a lot of time in the embedded space, right? It's not things which are perfect, and the things that are imperfect actually is the difficulty, right? Sorry, sorry, Cyrus, I interrupted. Some uh, no worries. Um, I think like one of the problems. Uh, I mean, uh, I completely agree with Jonathan on the on the strengths, and one of the problems is like it's it's, it's early, right? Like it's some um, it's an ecosystem that is it's a baby ecosystem. It's growing, so you have it will have a lot of like growing pains as, as part of as part of that. I think on the long term, one of the problems is it makes you dependent of a runtime, right? Like as you have like um, a WebAssembly pile, how you are able, gonna be able to run it. So that's one of the problem or one kind of, I, I don't see it as a problem, but this one dependency that you add on, on, on to your stack. Regarding like, um, just having like a, a unified or not unified API and kind of like what are the problems that that brings. I actually completely agree. Like there are some cases where actually having a unified API, you have like super custom sensor that is doing like custom things that are like actually like completely a part of like normal normal APIs. It's gonna be hard for you to fit that. And I think like one of the strengths of WebAssembly is you can either in that case, like there will be like a set of standards, I guess, in the future, so like for IoT. But if, in, if for whatever reason your your thing doesn't fit that, you can always kind of like create a custom import or a custom uh, way of like using that uh, that that thing. Um, so that means like you can always like use a custom API to use for your your custom device. The only thing, the only bad thing is probably only your your device is gonna be able to run it. But if you're okay with that, then like that that should be uh, that should be fine with uh, with the feature regarding regarding uh, WebAssembly on on IoT. I still think like it's, uh, yeah, it, it's early. So there is a lot of effort need to be done on like unifying. And I think on, on that sense, we can learn a lot about like how actually like Chrome, for example, is trying to unify like some kind of like serial ports or like some kind of APIs on the browser, learn from these APIs and bring them back to into the WebAssembly world. Just like, so the IoT speaks like that, that unified API when possible. So I think that might be like something that like might happen in the future. Um, but for sure, like there's need like a lot of effort done on the tooling space and, and on the ecosystem just kind of like to bring these things. But at the same time, I think we are gonna see explosive explosive growth 
because um, like, for example, once you are able to compile, for example, from Python to WebAssembly, which is one of the things that we are working on, um, once you are able to do that, uh, you can actually bring a lot of people in the Python ecosystem to create programs for IoT. And, and then suddenly, like, you... Oh, internet hiccup? Can you still hear me? No, no, we can hear you. We can hear you, yeah. Okay, perfect. Actually, it's clearer. <laughs> it's actually gone clear. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, so I think on that front, um, we are going to see a lot of upsides right. from um, from bringing like much more people on the ecosystem right. that before were actually like much harder to do. So um, I think on that sense, like it equilibrates, and on the long term, is going to be a very very good bet. Yeah, yeah, exciting stuff actually. What, what can people mm -hmm. on the call do to learn more, get involved more? I suppose with WebAssembly. So what, what was? Oh, oh, go ahead. Uh, as a general language and the specification, there's a um, community group. Um, they, we just had a meeting at, at the same time as the summit. It's open to anyone, as long as you're a member of the W3C. Um, you as an individual, you as your company, um, open forum. Um, it was great. We had researchers who are doing security and ex um, extensions to how to make it more secure um, to new languages, and et cetera. That's this general WebAssembly. Um, the Bytecode Alliance is the um, organization that's you know, sort of a sibling organization to, to WebAssembly itself. Um, for taking WebAssembly beyond the browser. Uh, you know, like I said, Intel is involved with their Whammer. I think it'd be great to have more hardware folks and firmware folks involved in those conversations so that we can talk about things like, well, how do you do um, you know, access to a, a network interface on your device? Oh, it's all in software? Oh, it's in hardware, et cetera. Those kind of, um, that experience. Um, but, you know, so those, those people who don't want to write that low level stuff can at least hear from the people who do uh, what's the right way to implement it. Um, and I, you know, I think uh, playing around with it would be great uh, from, an, from the perspective of people building embedded systems. Um, it's actually enlightening for the folks who are compiler engineers and web engineers who are driving some of the stuff to, to understand how you experience it um, and, and share that online. That's really good. So this has been way better than I actually was expecting. <laughs> it was completely coherent. There was no loud noises. So if, if people are, are okay with it, uh, I, any reservations about me posting the video, I'll clip the, the, the start and the, begin, and the end part, like this part, off. But uh, I, I would like to post this because I, I think this is really, really good, actually. Okay. Any objections? No? Okay. All right. Uh, any other questions or anything or other discussion points? No? That's good. Yeah. I, yes. I have a question. Oh, pass it. Yes. Yeah. So um, when we are writing in the systems code, we usually um, try to take advantage of um, stuff like um, caching, memory alignments, and all. I'm not quite sure of how WebAssembly does that, or if it can. Yeah, I think the, the general question is, you know, memory management and, and being efficient and taking advantage of hardware peripherals around memory, um, early days, yeah. right? The, the, the model yeah. of where WebAssembly came from was you have your isolated memory and that's your own memory sandbox and the browser underneath it figures out how to secure it and make sure you can't jump in or out and other things. That's, that's, that's your, your sandbox. Even sharing of memory is still, uh, Cyrus, is that still early days, right, between um, applications? Um, yeah, so. it's there were like some tricky things about like share memory or share or write buffers, which is like around like security. Um, I think only Google have uh, right now like solved it on the on the browser. Firefox is actually like gonna enable that. Um, but regarding it's it's regarding like memory key, uh, well, memory key, memory memory and and um, and uh, kind of like what are all the constraints that we have on WebAssembly, I think on the long term, all these constraints are actually gonna be gonna be solved. And not just gonna be solved, they are actually gonna be as fast as, as you will get in native. Because it's gonna be like a two-way two -way thing where actually you can transform things very easily from native to WebAssembly and actually the other way around. So I think on the long term, um, I actually think there should not be any issues right now regarding memory management on if you have like a Rust embedded, uh, a Rust program, compiled to WebAssembly that you want to run in embedded. Um, but if you see some of those, uh, I th I'm i very confident they are going to be solved uh, as soon as more people begin to that. It's just a matter of time. 
And I, I think it goes back to the, uh, the exposing the capabilities of embedded platforms up into the WebAssembly uh, in WebAssembly land, for lack of better terms. Um, just like a peripheral and access to the, you know, let's call it the the vendor specific APIs or you know, mapping to a HAL which talks to something lower level. Uh, those concepts don't exist in in WebAssembly's current uh, you know, vernacular. Um, and you know, even things like crypto and timers and and, and cores, right? Those are not uh, even defined yet. So I think that will be part of that evolution of how do we specify? How do we work with hardware? How do we um, go that one level deeper uh, from, a, from a language specification while all maintaining all the traits and capabilities of, of WebAssembly as, it's, as it stands today. So the cop out answer, it's awesome. early. Thank you. <laughs> sure. All right, thank you. Um, one, one, one thing I would throw out there, and, and I think Cyrus talked about a little bit, is uh, with some of these embedded runtimes, so WASM3 and, and Whammer, um, it is C++ code. And so some of the demos we did, we just went in there and exposed some of the lower level HAL APIs as a custom API. Um, directly into the, the WebAssembly um, address space. So that's how people are doing it today. Um, so if something we want to explore, that's definitely a one path. All right, awesome. Anything else? Anybody, anything, any other topics? We're coming up on it. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. And I'm going to, I might edit a little bit, but I'll post the video because I, I feel like this is really valuable and a lot of people are going to enjoy this actually. Uh, and thanks so much to everybody for, for, for participating. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, yes, thank you for organizing. <laughs>